we're going to do a quick review of, the, uh, of uh, what we covered last week. Um, you know, we, we finished a major milestone in the book, which is through chapter 8. We got through the very uh, the beginning all the way through the centerpiece of the book. And now that he has gone through, well, the superiority of Yeshua to angels and the superiority of Yeshua to prophets and the superiority of Yeshua to Moses and the superiority of Yeshua to uh, Abraham and the superiority of Yeshua to, uh, to Aaron and the superiority of uh, Yeshua's priesthood to the Levitical priesthood and the superiority of the New Covenant to the Mosaic Covenant, we are now free to move on to our next section. So again, in closing the uh, chapter 8 uh, and the superiority of the New Covenant, we see that the author is clear that God never intended for his Torah to become a Reader's Digest abridged version, which is the only way the Torah can function today. Uh, you must ignore or spiritualize or explain away every bit of Levitical ministry related to sacrifice and to the temple worship within Torah. But that would leave us with a Reader's Digest abridged version. And he concludes chapter 8, that's the final verse of chapter 8, when he said a new covenant, he's made the first, in other words, the Mosaic covenant, obsolete. Whatever is becoming obsolete, that was becoming obsolete 2,000 years ago, and growing old, is ready to disappear. So if we think about the actual um, uh, active lifespan of Torah, according to the New Testament teaching, right? So Torah was given roughly 1446 uh, thereabouts BC. And so if Yeshua is roughly 30, his death, burial, resurrection is roughly 33 AD, you have, again, give or take uh, a decade, you have a 1500 year period of time where Torah was the efficient and effective way, means, through which God related to the Jewish people. Well, it's been 2,000 years since Yeshua was resurrected, since he died and was resurrected, ascended, and was exalted at the right hand of his Father. So, if you think about it, the active, vibrant years of Torah were outmatched by 500 years, 1,500 years between Moses and Jesus. But 2,000 years now of new covenant. So if it was becoming obsolete 2,000 years ago, it had only been in existence 1,500 years at that point. It was becoming obsolete and growing old and ready to disappear. Well then, what is the status today, right? We talked about obsolete uh, and replaced technology, the A-track, the reel-to-reel, -reel, the records, the cassettes, now the CDs, the MP3s. We looked at the timeline of televisions and we saw how uh, television, nobody would go back and try to watch a uh, analog black and white 13-inch or even a 19-inch screen when you can uh, have a, a, a flat screen Today, ah, thank you so much. Wonderful, good. Okay, good. So, because the ultimate issue is not any specific areas of Mosaic legislation. Again, that leaves a slice and dice with a, a bridge version. So, not specific areas of Mosaic legislation. Actually, the issue is not even Torah itself as a legislative body. See, it's not a matter of laws or a body of laws, it's a matter of the covenant from which those laws are derived. The covenant laws are derived from Mosaic Covenant. We now have New Covenant. 
Now, Mosaic Covenant contains Torah. We have the New Covenant, and the New Covenant is obviously replaced. That's the whole argument of chapter 8. The New Covenant has replaced it. And Hebrew argue, Hebrews argues the whole Mosaic Covenant as an entire contractual constitutional system of how to relate to God, a system of relating to him, to God and his people. That system, forget content for a moment, because there's a lot of overlap between the content of the one and the other, but the system itself has been replaced. Much like driving is very, I brought this out last week, uh, driving is similar from state to state, but there are some very specific differences that you really better pay attention to, uh, to know that you're driving in Florida or Georgia and not Texas or New York or New Jersey. Uh, in New Jersey, uh, when you want to make a left turn, you actually have to make a right turn and go through what is a, a, called a jug handle and go around the bend like a clover leaf um, to be able to turn left. It's the craziest thing, but it works in New Jersey. Uh, it wouldn't work so well in Texas. But nonetheless, uh, they both involve driving, and so there's similarity. Suggesting that participation in any portion of the Torah's legislative system is, is mandatory. In other words, there are people who believe that we must participate in Torah. We must keep Torah. We have an obligation to keep Torah. But to say that we must keep Torah, that it's mandatory, that it's obligatory, or that it's compulsory, think about it. Step back for a second from your reverence of Moses and understand how it reflects on Yeshua. It is an affront it is an offense to the sufficiency of our high priest ministry and his new covenant provisions, which is not to say that we are without law or without instruction. Have you read the New Testament any time recently? It is a book, an entire book, that is chock full uh, bigger than Torah, by the way. More rules, more regu uh, legislation than Torah, if you actually take it, take it apart. And harder ones to keep than Torah. It is a book that's filled with instruction, with imperatives, commands that we must do. So we are not without law. It's just that we have moved from law of Moses to the law of Messiah, as Paul points out in Galatians and in Corinthians. So what's the role of the Mosaic legislation in the life of the New Covenant believer, we asked. Well, it's a very legitimate question to ask because uh, we could uh, save our... Of course, my entire scripture is in the, in, the, in the iPad here, but those of us walking around with... And I, for decades, with an actual Bible, those things get, wind up being heavy. And if I could have removed four-fifths of the content, why, why didn't I? Well, because there's an important role for not only Mosaic legislation, but for the entire Hebrew Bible in the life of a New Testament believer. Because Torah, along with the entire Hebrew Bible, can and should play a central role in all New Covenant believers' spiritual lives. It does reveal the holy will of a righteous God and the history of God's relationship with his people. And as Paul pointed out, he said to Timothy, all scripture is profitable for instruction and correction and reproof and uh, insight so that the man or woman, the person of God, can indeed grow spiritually. So, it is essential that we read, that we understand, that we apply. Those, but the system is not how we relate to the Lord anymore. We're under a new covenant system. Okay? We have a new contract. Okay? So those of you who are, how many of you are teachers? Raise your hand if you're a teacher. Okay, a few of you teachers. Okay, so... A, uh, teachers uh, are hired under a particular contract and uh, they go about their teaching career, whatever, whatever position you're in, forget teaching, uh, whatever career you're in, it's a contract. 
But then a new contract, at some point in your career, a new contract is negotiated. And the new contract is now in force. And so you go about your life, you're still teaching, you're still uh, working, you're still going about your profession, but you are, so practically, um, you're living the same kind of lives that would be pleasing to your employer, um, but nonetheless, um, you are under a different system, you're under a different contract. The new contract has replaced the old contract. Sometimes that's for good, sometimes that's for bad. In this instance, it's of course for wonderful. Okay, it's excellent and marvelous. So we possess liberty to obey any of the Torah's precepts that don't contradict New Testament instruction. That's very clear. So we have liberty, we have freedom and Messiah to maintain as much of Torah as we want, just so far, just so long, <coughs> as it does not contradict New Testament instruction, which is something that as we spent time last year in the book of Acts, we, uh, experienced, we experienced along with the early church as they discovered, well, how does it actually work once you incorporate Gentiles and, and it's not just a Jewish thing and we just keep doing our own Jewish deal, but uh, we have to accommodate newcomers. So how will we all get along? How will we function under a new covenant as opposed to just the Old Covenant, okay? So now we are freed up to move on to the superiority of the Messiah's priestly service. We talked about the priesthood in general. Now we're gonna talk about the priestly service and how Messiah's priestly service, that which gets done in the heavenly tabernacle is superior to the activity that went on in the uh, original tabernacle or it is replaced with the, the temple. So now, here we go. Superiority of Messiah's priestly service. Now even the first covenant, that's the Mosaic covenant, had regulations of divine worship. These are the rules for divine worship and rules for the earthly sanctuary. How are you going to relate to God in worship? What is the function? What is the procedure? What is the correct uh, Robert's rules of order, if you will, for uh, serving within the earthly sanctuary? We saw in our Torah portion this morning that a violation of uh, procedure in the earthly sanctuary, in the tabernacle, was tragic, disastrous for Aaron's two eldest sons, Adav and Avihu, as they were stricken with fire from the Lord, from heaven, for defaming him at the altar somehow, violating his holiness in some way that we can only make assumptions about. It's not spelled out. Very, very serious violation. And remember that the tabernacle that we had in the wilderness is based upon a holy heavenly pattern, a reality in the heavenlies that can only be suggested by the blueprints that God handed Moses at Sinai. So he says to uh, Moses, see that you make them, uh, the tabernacle and all the implements, after the pattern for them, the model, the blueprints, the architectural prints, which were shown to you on the mountain, Exodus 25, 40, the uh, revelation at Sinai for Moses. And in verse 2, for there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer tabernacle, and this is the key to understanding Israel's worship, as it was set forward in the, uh, in the Mosaic Covenant, the, tab and the tabernacle was the central location of Israel's worship. It was a sanctuary. And it was a sanctuary in which God's Shekinah glory, his physical manifest presence, could take a permanent residence, residence among the nation. Literally, the Bible tells us that God's manifest presence, the Shekinah, was in the Holy 
of Holies. The tabernacle, remember, was designed as a representation of the true tabernacle in heaven as was revealed to Moses and generation after generation after generation, the Israelites would worship here in this tabernacle for four centuries. For four centuries, from Moses to Solomon, the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, would worship within the tabernacle until it was time to say goodbye, farewell to the tabernacle. Again, tab the concept of the tabernacle, that was, it went beyond the actual physical uh, presence of the tabernacle. The tabernacle wound up being replaced by something superior. Does that sound familiar, right? So nobody, once they had the temple in place built by Solomon, Nobody would go back or wanted to go back to the old portable tent system, which served very well for its period of time, but was eventually replaced by something much better and grander, the Temple of Solomon, which was eventually replaced by, so, knocked down, of course, uh, demolished, destroyed, rebuilt, but eventually replaced by something even grander than what Solomon had envisioned, which was the temple that was renovated, re rebuilt by Herod in the second temple era. So we have this, take a look at this uh, tabernacle is surrounded with this, the, the whole uh, tabernacle surrounded by a courtyard, okay, which sacrifices are going on, washing, but the building itself is a, so in other words, the entire structure, the courtyard, is not technically the tabernacle, the holy place. The holy place is just that flat-topped uh, tent building, uh, and we're not talking about large uh, dimensions, talking about uh, length, um, about 45 feet. 45 feet, it's not a huge, we're not talking about a football field, people. Right? 15 feet up in height, uh, 15 feet uh, wide, so it's rather humble, I, I think, and you have in this Tabernacle, you have a subdivision in the back which separates the tab, which is called the holy place. This now separates into the back room, which is the holy of holies or the holiest place. So inside this tabernacle, I'm going to show you some pictures in a moment, but inside the initial room, prior to uh, seeing the back room, and nobody saw the back room except the high priest once a year, one day out of each year, separated by a, a, a veil, by a curtain. But this initial room, this ante room, well, that was the area where the priests uh, did their daily sanctuary ministry. And in that back room, the second, uh, the subdivision, the Holy of Holies, David Tome, one day a year, so and that was cube-shaped in the back, okay? So you have the front room and you have the back. So there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one, and now he's going to move on to some of the furniture, or the furniture of the, of the tabernacle, mentioning point by point, in which was the lampstand. So you had the lampstand, that's the, uh, the menorah, that's the seven-branched uh, Candlestick, the lampstand, one massive piece of solid, pure gold. How much did it weigh? Estimates go from uh, 75 pounds on the low end to 125 pounds on the high end. Nonetheless, this is a very, very important uh, component of the tabernacle. It was positioned uh, on the south side. Inside the tabernacle itself, if you look at the, the, the construction of it, you see that it's uh, patterned after an almond tree, right? The first of the uh, promised lands uh, blossoms to, uh, trees to blossom in the spring. And you've got six 
branches, three on each side, and you've got the central shaft, the seventh branch. So why do you need this lampstand, this menorah? Because, I don't know if you noticed, do you see any windows in the tent? There's no windows in the tent. So it provides the light source. And the tabernacle was never to be, or the uh, menorah was never to be extinguished. That's why Hanukkah is such a big deal, right? And it was tended morning and evening by the priests. Its undying flame symbolized the presence of God among the people. And so twice a day, the priests would clean the seven lamps. They'd trim the wicks. They'd replenish the olive oil. So which were the lampstand? This, by the way, is... Uh, the Arch of Titus, and this relief on the Arch of Titus pictures the carving, this beautiful, powerful carving, uh, shows us a representation of what the actual menorah looked like in the temple. This is the, the best, this is right after the temple was destroyed, and the uh, implements of the temple were taken away, carted off, to Rome, and this is what the menorah looked like in the uh, temple. We now have the table and the sacred bread. What table? The table of showbread. It was uh, made of wood overlaid with gold, and it held the bread of the presence, or the 12 lives of showbread or display bread. Those were 12 loaves of un Leaven bread, those are a little thick to be unleavened bread, but nonetheless arranged in two rows on perpetual display before the Lord. They were eventually eaten uh, each week. They replaced the bread weekly. They were eaten by the, by the priests. Uh, every Sabbath you had new bread that was uh, replaced it. And uh, you had, uh, uh, just like the Ark of the Covenant, you've got poles on either side so it can be transported with rings. You can see the rings there. And uh, that was also in the holy place, the showbread. And this, by the way, you can see, here's the menorah, you can see in the corner, you see the menorah, uh, but then you see uh, in front of the menorah there, they're carrying the temple of show, or the, uh, the table of showbread with them that also went into exile, it went into Roman captivity with the Jewish people. Now, this is called the holy place. So, that tabernacle, again, as opposed to the most holy place, the interior room, this outer room, which is the first room you walk into, that's called the holy place. Now, behind the second veil, there was a tabernacle, which is called the holy of holies. That's the veil. And as you can look and you peer before the veil or beyond the veil, and the only person who could Peer, remember, was the high priest, David Tillman. Uh, you see the Ark of the Covenant. So behind the second veil, there was a tabernacle, which was called the Holy of Holies. This is the only thing that is in the Holy of Holies. And there was the most important. Why? Because the Ark of the Covenant served as God's throne. We'll look at its construction momentarily. But for right now, I want to move to his next point. Having a golden altar of incense, that is another thing that was in the holy place. Notice the horns on the altar of incense, also the rings and the poles where it can be transported um, uh, to carry the, uh, the rings, to carry the, uh, the altar of incense by the rings. We have a, uh, this was carted away as well, but we have um, a stone altar of incense that was discovered in Megiddo. And uh, we can see the design of the stone altar, which was obviously not portable, no rings, no poles, and a big old stone altar of incense. But nonetheless, that is modeled along the same 
lines as the altar of incense that was in the tabernacle and later on in the temple. And of course, the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold. This is the throne of God, an open-topped chest. How'd they make it? Again, the acacia wood overlaid inside and out with gold. How big is this thing? Would you be surprised to know that the Ark of the Covenant is not longer than four feet long? It's like less than four feet long. Um, its width is about uh, two feet. So about four feet by two feet rectangle. And you've got the pole with the ring so that you can cover because remember, you don't want to touch the Ark of the Covenant. Remember what happened when the guy, Uzzah, uh, touched the Ark of the Covenant. He died immediately. But this is what the Ark of the Covenant would have looked like. What did it contain? Oh, well, actually, uh, I want to point out to you this. I just thought this was so cool. We actually, we, archaeologists, when they uh, uncovered King Tut's tomb, King Tut Uncommon, the great Egyptian pharaoh, which is a little bit later than a century or, or more, uh, later than the uh, time of Moses. And the, but nonetheless, look at this ark that they found. It has uh, a representation of a god, I think it's Anubis, who's on top, on the lid. It's carried by poles, and it's roughly the same dimensions. Uh, so, in other words, when God implemented the uh, building of the tabernacle, later the temple, and uh, uh, the implements of the temple. Uh, he's not inventing stuff for the Israelites that has never been seen in the history of the world before. He's basically saying, okay, just like you're familiar, you're familiar with a lot of stuff in Egypt, okay? But we're going to make an adaptation to worshiping God. Those are counterfeits, poor reflections of the reality in the heavenlies, but uh, we're going to have a more accurate model um, for my throne. Uh, I'm not Anubis, and therefore you won't see me. I'm not, you know, don't carve me on the top. You will carve instead uh, the, uh, the uh, cherubim. You will be, uh, those are going to be up on top. This is going to be God's throne. It's called God's throne multiple times in Scripture. For example, 2 Samuel when David brings the ark to Jerusalem, chapter 6, verse 2, <clears throat> David arose, went with all the people who were with him to Baal Yehuda, to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the very name of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned above the cherubim. And we have Psalm 80 along the same lines. Oh, give ear, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph, like a flock, you who are enthroned above the cherubim shine forth. So again, this image of the uh, cherubim and then this being God's, where the Shekhinah would appear, God's throne is endemic. It's all through the literature and all through the concepts that are shared here. And inside that it's a top that you could remove. And inside that, a lid. Inside that lid, like, kind of like a coffin, right? Inside that lid was a golden jar. It held manna. What's manna? Exactly right. Exactly, precisely. What is it? Um, uh, they, they preserved some manna from the time of Moses in the golden jar. That's not the golden jar. That's not even a representation of the golden jar. That just happens to be a golden jar. Uh, a golden jar, uh, and uh, these are representations. And Aaron's rod, which budded, remember that story from Numbers, and the tables of the covenant, the tablets, the Ten Commandments. So you got manna, and you've got Aaron's rod that budded, the almond, uh, almond blossoms, and the Ten Commandments. Those are all in 
inside that ark. Those are the treasures inside. The lid fashioned of pure gold. But of these things, which he just mentioned in passing, we cannot now speak in detail. Really, why did you bring them up? So many people, they take this as an excuse. They write an entire book, do an entire presentation. Christ in the tabernacle. And they take each one of these elements and they show you how um, it, it's a symbol. It's a prefigurement. It's a, it's a sign of the Messiah. It's a prophetic picture of Messiah. Now, that sells books, but it's not found in Scripture. It's not found in the book of Hebrews. This is not what he's about to do. He doesn't, he doesn't even... This is, how, this is how empty this section is of fascinating tidbits. He doesn't even have the politeness to mention Indiana Jones. Can you imagine? Right? Not, not a, talk about the Ark of the Covenant and you don't even mention uh, Indiana Jones. No, but it's not about that. It's not about... He said, these things, you're familiar with these things. But we cannot speak about them in detail. My job is not to make a connection between the tabernacle and the implements of the tabernacle and every nuance of Messiah's ministry. That's not what I'm doing here. I'm giving you a big picture, an overview of how the tabernacle was designed and how it functioned. Why? Why go through that exercise, Mr. Author of Hebrews? In order to arrive at his point, which is the superiority of the Messiah's priestly ministry over the Levitical. So having surveyed the components of the Levitical sanctuary, the author proceeds to summarize the actual Levitical service. So prior to penetrating the veil and into the activities of the inner sanctum, uh, he first uh, uh, talks about what happens in the outer room, and he stresses the daily grind of the never-ending continual activity required of priests year after year, day after day after day, month after month, year after year, generation after generation of these priests to properly maintain the sanctuary, tend the menorah, the perpetual flame, offer the incense twice daily, morning and the evening, the showbread, replace it every week. What changes are the faces of individual priests as the decades go on in each cycle of service within each year. But the requirements of the priesthood were monotonous and incessant. Now when these things have been so prepared, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle, performing the divine worship. You can see here the offering on the altar outside the holy place, inside the courts of the tabernacle. Behind it is the, ta the altar, you have the tabernacle. Behind it, inside the tabernacle, the, inner wall, the, the outer room, and then the holy of holies before it. But into the second, in other words, the Holy of Holies, the back room, the second room, only the high priest enters once a year and not without taking blood. Why does he take blood? He tells us. Which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. Notice that the author of Hebrews is very clear on what the Levitical system is all about. Blood being offered for the sins of the Levitical priests, even the high priests, and the people of Israel that were committed in ignorance. 
What about the sins that were committed with full-bodied, rebellious intention? What's called in the Mosaic legislation, sin with a high hand. What about those sins? Levitical service system made no provision for those sins. If you were to do a survey of your sins, your own personal sins, over the past 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, whatever it may be, and say, okay, let's just do a quick survey, an inventory of my sins, and uh, which of my, how much, what's the percentage of my sins that were unintentional, that just happened because I, I messed up or whatever, and some that were like, yeah, I know it's wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. Sins with a high hand. Well, <coughs> there's no provision in the Levitical system. So if you sin with a high hand, with full intentionality, then you're appreciating very clearly the power and the superiority of our Messiah's ministry and the new covenant where there is forgiveness for those sins that, even those sins that were intentionally committed with full knowledge aforehand, right? Even those sins can be forgiven. Sins that were not able to be forgiven in the Levitical system. Well, anyway, again, this Day of Atonement um, and the importance of blood. Without blood, there is no atonement at all. And this is true even with the temple that stands at that day. It says, the, which he offers for himself the sins of the people. So whether it's the tabernacle, whether it's the Solomonic temple, whether it's Herod's temple, plays out the same way. You have the holy place, you have the uh, interior, holy of holies, and you have only one person entering into the uh, presence of God. Take a look very, very briefly. This is a, a, a model, a diagram of the interior of the temple. It's just a, a bigger, showier, flashier, uh, and more substantial uh, uh, design on the tabernacle, which was a reflection of the Holy of Holies. Same idea. So you have the interior, the first interior wall. In the, the, you've got the lampstand, you've got the altar of incense, you've got the table of showbread, just like we looked at the tabernacle. Then you have the veil, and the veil separates the holy of holies from the holy place. The Holy Spirit, he says, why are you telling us this? Because the Holy Spirit is signifying this. That the way it's, I'm, not, I'm just reporting of what the Holy Spirit has revealed to me. This is not my clever creativity. This is what the Holy Spirit says. My, this awareness is not because of my insight into the typological connection between Yeshua and Levitical worship. This is through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, of the Ruach HaKodesh. So that absolutely would have gotten the attention of his readers, the Hebrew believers, the Hebrews uh, Jewish believers who were in need of this message. The Holy Spirit is signifying this. The way into the holy place had not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing. The way into the holy place had not been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing. Well, most assuredly, the temple at that point still stood. The common people in the time of the temple, as was the time of the tabernacle, they could only ever get so close to the personal presence of God. How close could you get as a common person in the tabernacle or in the temple? As close as the courtyard. How close could the priests get? As close to God as the veil. That's as far as they went. And even for the high priest, access was restricted just to that one guy one day each year. How can you have open, unrestricted access to God with a Levitical system under the, under the Torah? 
under the structure of Torah. You can't. The only way you can establish open access, in other words, can I approach my father directly, our father directly, or do I have to have an intermediary? And have a, the only way you can have open access, which is what we have now, is through abolition of the Levitical system of worship. That's what he's arguing here. And believe me, it's a tough pill. It's a difficult pill. This is what you've known all your life. This is what your people have known for 1,500 years. Imagine these readers of Hebrews. How challenging this message would have been. Really? Do, do you need to be so, so, so strong? Do you have to argue so strongly on this? And the author says, yeah, I do. Because anything less makes less of what our Messiah has done for us. And he says that the tabernacle is a symbol for the present time. The term he uses is parabola. You know this? You know what a parabola is in mathematics? Because where we get, uh, it's also uh, where we get in speech, we get the idea of parable, uh, a, a symbolic illustration, a symbol. But we also get the concept that we couldn't receive dish network without a parable, uh, without a parabola, right? This is what it looks like, okay? It's like, uh, uh, you, you, you go down the street and you'll see two of them together at McDonald's, two golden parabolas, right? Uh, but he said, this is a parabola. It's a symbol for our present age. The Levitical system could never make the worshiper perfect. Symbol for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience. Perfection was not found. It could never be found through the Levitical system. Those rituals only serve to cleanse the external component of man from sin's defilement. You want to affect internal nature under the Levitical system, under the Mosaic Code, you're out of luck. You cannot get to the heart, literally, of the matter through Moses, through Levi. You cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience since they relate only to food and drink and various washings. Uh, you know, mikvah, uh, th there were ritual washings, and ritual washings are an important component. You still see Jewish people doing it today. And in fact, baptism, a mikvah, by the way, the steps, just look, you're looking down, uh, and you climb down uh, those steps. You walk down the steps, and uh, there's water inside. You immerse yourself. Uh, when you wanted to go to the temple, you immersed yourself. When you needed to be ritually cleansed, you immersed yourself. Uh, you, People still do this today. And we have, as believers, we have adapted this, uh, this practice of what we call believer's baptism, believer's immersion. Same idea. It's a mikvah. You go down and you uh, exercise the immersion. So, and even today, if you've been to Israel, you see that there is a, there's little pots and a little water. And if you need to pour the water, it's, it's not because they're dirty. It's because of ceremonial clean, cleaning before the Lord. What he's arguing ultimately, I'm wrapping it up here. <sighs> These are regulations for the body, the external. Literally, washing the outside, but you can't cleanse the inside. It's a perfect illustration. Immerse yourself all you want, but the water of the mikvah never goes inside you drown, okay? Um, the ceremonial pouring of washing of hands, or whatever, that affects nothing internally. It's only for the body. And those regulations for the external were imposed only until, and this is where his passage ends, only until a time of reformation, a time of correction, a time when God is going to make things right. That's what this word means. It's the only time it shows up in the New Testament. 
This is a new age that we're in. An age when God is making things right between himself and his people. Once the serious season of correction arrives with the death, burial, and resurrection of our Messiah, the imposition of a new covenant and a new high priest, the Levitical system of worship becomes superfluous. So let me conclude. The Levitical system of worship, think about it. It must have exerted on the readers uh, an extremely powerful, <coughs> powerful political, social, and emotional pressure. Imagine the social, political, emotional pressure as a Jew in Israel, in Judea, at that particular time under Roman occupation. That pressure was to reaffirm their trust in the sacrificial system. Look around, everybody's doing it. Look at the beautiful temple. That tem nothing's going to ever happen to that temple, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, just what the Jews in Jeremiah's time cried. While well, a man's eyes, the Mosaic system is exercised within the second temple, appeared to be at the pinnacle of its grandeur. Who can top this wonder of the world, this beautiful temple, this fantastic system? Nonetheless, the author here is telling us that in God's eyes, at the time of his writing in the mid-60s, three decades after the exaltation of our Messiah, in God's eyes, the temple, the Levitical system, the Mosaic covenant was already superfluous and obsolete. Yes, I said it again. Superfluous, obsolete, and most to the point of the author here, ineffective. There is only one way that we can relate to God today. And the door we walk through, believe me, is not Moses. It is Yeshua. And only Yeshua. It is not Yeshua plus Moses or Yeshua plus anyone. It is faith, trust, and the power of his finished work on the cross and out of the grave, ascending to heaven, exalted at the right hand of power. That's the argument that he begins chapter 9 with. We'll continue talking about the, we've now looked at the components of the sanctuary. Now we're going to look at the superiority next time of our Messiah's sacrifice. Why was his sacrifice? We've talked about his priesthood. Let's talk about the sacrifice. Why his sacrifice was miles away from the blood of bulls and goats. But that'll wait for next time. Let's stay.